Hello, everyone. Happy Monday. I hope you all had a wonderful weekend and a wonderful day so far. So well, without further ado, let's hop right into today's episode. Let's start off with quite the bizarre story. You see, one of my biggest fears is a movie, like The Thing, coming to life. And while that seems like a ridiculous fear, because the Arctic researchers discovering a shape-shifting creature, the actual fear of pulling something that could harm the human race from the ice that's been frozen for millions of years is an actual credible fear. And while I know what you're thinking, animals couldn't survive frozen in ice for millions of years and just come back to life, and I know we won't find shape-shifting creatures or aliens in the ice, microbes and viruses can survive. I mean, recently, the scientific community was shocked when we discovered a rotifer that wasn't just frozen in ice for 24,000 years. But upon being unfrozen, it was alive and well. Now, a rotifer is basically a microscopic organism. They aren't bacteria, but animals on the microscopic scale, uh, kind of like water bears. But instead of the Arctic, the team pulled it from the Siberian permafrost from a depth of 11 feet or 3.5 meters, which isn't hard to get to considering the fact that the Siberian permafrost is melting at an ungodly rate that will put the entire Russian country and its neighbors at risk of flooding, landslides, and sinkholes, but also helped bolster the black market. Quite the weird juxtaposition. But back to our little friend, who was once unfrozen able to clone itself and basically reproduce, like it was just one long nap and not frozen on the brink of death. Now, while the preserved mammals we have pulled from the permafrost couldn't be revived, this discovery proves a scary truth, that even viruses can survive. That's where my fear comes in. I mean, we are still in the grips of a global pandemic, something we as the general public never expected, but we still have built up a pretty good defense to the SARS family of viruses, even if it's just a little bit of immunity. But what happens if our bodies encounter a virus or disease that our genetics hasn't dealt with for thousands of years? Now take that even further to a disease or virus that existed at the time of the dinosaurs before most modern day mammals or their ancestors and our ancestors we would have no way to evolve or adapt to it. That's why this simple rotifer discovery worries me. Because if we look at Antarctica as an example, it will reach the tipping point where a majority of the surface ice will have melted within 40 years. But its full melting won't happen till about 500 years. And in Siberia, the permafrost will be fully melted by the end of the century. Both these figures are scary and call, will cause a complete chaotic reorganization and extinction of the food chain and various biomes and ecosystems. That's why I'm always worried about climate change. Now, I know what you're saying. We won't be around in 500 years. Well, I know it's natural for Antarctica to melt because the planet will always go through the same cycles unless it has outside interference like meteors, but we should expect Antarctica to naturally melt within 15 to 30 million years. But like I said, it's going to be 500 years, showing our giant impact on the environment. I think things like this are something we need to keep in mind, especially since the worst disease we have ever encountered as a species, the bubonic plague or the Black Death. We recently discovered samples from 5,000 years ago frozen. They weren't alive, but we can discover viruses and diseases frozen, and that worries me. And also, if more and more viruses and disease become antibiotic resistant, think about the ancient ones. That honestly scares me. Now, let's end this episode with a more positive story on how we might be able to curb climate change. For 53 years, the San Jeromino Golf Course in San Jeromino, California, saw millions of players play for their heart to their heart's content for the better part of the last half a century. And upon its closure in 2018, it just sat there like a desolate wasteland, waiting to be reclaimed by nature. But a nonprofit had an idea of how to use it. Around where I live, I've seen many golf courses 
turn into complexes filled with hundreds of luxury condominiums and apartments. But what if instead we could give them back to nature? And in various places all around the United States, they've also been turned into shopping malls, Amazon warehouses, and entire suburban complexes. Well, this nonprofit had the idea to turn golf courses into protective parks, and upon buying the course for $8.8 .8 million, they found old creeks that had been buried or paved over. The fairways were able to be reclaimed by nature, and wildlife started to come back and flourish. And one of the most important projects will be to revive the endangered salmon native to the region by giving them clear riverways and creeks so they can migrate upstream. Unheeded by the golf course, which we built and disrupted their migration. And that's not all they are making. They are also making this a public park with trails and paths that can connect to nearby complexes and residences while not impeding the reclamation of the course of nature. And this is not just some small park. It's about 157 acres. That's about an eighth the size of Central Park in New York City. So an astounding giant piece of land. But how is this going to curb climate change? Well, just by connecting the rivers and creeks. Like I said again, it will allow wildlife to return to their natural habitats and not become extinct. We can put a local ecosystem back to its normal state before it goes fully out of whack. Now this is only the beginning. There are about 16,000 golf courses in the United States, 130 closed during quarantine, and 1,500 closed during the last 15 years. And at least a few dozen of those have been turned into nature parks, or just parks in general. And in the coming decades, with rising sea levels and more golf courses, especially coastal ones, becoming more wetland environments, the need to abandon coastal golf courses will be a necessity, and giving those back to nature will provide beneficial to the climate and the environment. And considering that over a thousand golf courses are in Florida alone, I can foresee that they might have to abandon them in the next half a century. Nevertheless, I think this is a big move in the right direction. I've always looked at the giant apartment complexes being built in the last five years and wondered if we really need them and wonder if nature needs them more, if we need more trees. We need to build back our environment, so this just might be what we need to return our natural environment back to the way it was, and in turn, maybe our climate problems will improve even just a little. Even just a little actually helps a lot. Well, that is all I got for today. If you enjoyed the show, I'd really appreciate a follow, subscribe, or just a share to anyone you think would like the show. Until we meet again, my friends, remember, educating yourself is the greatest form of self-care, self-love, and empowerment one can achieve.